give me the thumbs up to see whether you can say that you can see that slide. Can people see that? OK, so today let me just pull it onto slides. So today I'm here really to help answer this question of how can I help you in National Apprenticeship Week to um, and to explore what you think about becoming an apprentice physio or an occup phys uh, apprentice occupational therapist. Um, here in LCHS, there are both routes to these uh, to these pathways of learning. Um, they've both been established for about three years now, and it's expected that they will continue in the future and will consolidate this way of working in within our local workforce. So welcome. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the apprenticeship um, and how it's developed. So in essence, apprentices are one of many routes into um, becoming a state registered physiotherapist or occupational therapist. The difference is um, with apprenticeships is that you learn on the job. So you're in effect employed by this, this organisation into a, a post that you're either currently in or that you've been successful in applying for and you learn on the job. So you get paid for being here um, and you will ensure uh, in terms of getting paid, you will work to what's called Annex 22, where if you meet some of the academic gateways and some of the pathways that's required for each level of the course, then that will reflect in the salary that you get. We work very closely within uh, within the organisation to our own values, um, something called the LCHS way, um, and we develop that and look for that in our potential uh, apprentices. And we work towards the values of the wider NHS where we recognise that we treat people with dignity, respect um, and inclusion. I need to say now that if you're thinking of doing an apprenticeship and you think it's an easy way of securing a degree, I need to give you a bit of a reality shock, not to put you off, but actually tell you that you have to become a very good juggler. You have to become a very good juggler as you study work, study and go out on placement across Lincolnshire. We'll talk a bit more about the placements in, uh, in a few minutes and why they're really important. So if you are interested, we need to know that you are committed um, and that you have a high degree of resilience, that you're going to stick with it even when it gets tough. But equally, you're going to know when to ask for help. Who can help you along that journey? Who's the go to person to secure, um, secure that bit of help, that re bit of reassurance? And I suppose I, I, as one of the clinical practice educators within the service, are one of those people, as is Katie from the um, from the apprenticeship centre. I can signpost you to or reassure you that you're going in the right direction to keep being brave, to be keep being courageous, um, but also to help in some of the academic requirements of the course. It is, as I said earlier, a new way of learning. Um, we're only about three, four four cohorts in with the universities that we work for and we've not had yet um, a cohort that's graduated um, so we're still we're still learning as we go along and refining um, as a service as an organization how we work um, and produce the apprenticeship pathways so one of the questions that people often ask me is, well, how do I get there? What do I need? Well, you need to meet the minimum entry criteria for each university. 
We work with two universities, as you'll see from the next slide. You need to meet some minimal requirements um, in terms of English and maths. Um, and also a care certificate is also a, a great resource to have. Um, but we need you to have evidence of recent studies. So for the people who've recently done things like the assistant practitioner course, that's a level four level entry. Um, um, that would be great to do that. We also need you to work out for yourself what your preferred role is um, and be able to explain to me or to other colleagues why you want to be a physio or why you want to be an OT. Now, sometimes people, um, especially when they're working as, um, as support workers and they have a they may be doing a bit of physio and a bit of OT, a bit of speech and language therapy, a bit of all sorts within that. They come to us and they, they want that to be their role, just a bit more extended. That isn't quite how it is in the way that you you, you have to make a decision and, um, and decide I'm more physio based or more OT based and be able to articulate that. The other thing is, if you are successful, then you have to be aware that you're expected to attend all of the university training days um, and be, you need to be present. Now, in the current environment um, with the pandemic, the way that courses have been delivered has changed in that some, some courses have been totally um, uh, delivered by a Zoom or Teams. Um, and then that face to face element has uh, not been present. I was discussing with one of the universities we work with this morning. Um, how they're planning to go forward in the future, and they're recognizing that many apprentices come from um, quite a long way away. So then in the future, they're going to look at what's called a blended learning approach where some weeks you might do um, you might do all your learning online via Teams um, and other weeks you'd be expected to go into, into the university. We'd also expect you a bit to be a team player on lots of different levels. First of all, you're a team player in that you, you would be part of the LCHS community. So you are an ambassador for our organisation when you go out there. So we, ex we expect you to be to speak kindly about our organisation. Um, sometimes we we're all human and we will get it and not always get it right, but we won't. We expect you to be supportive of what an opportunity you be being offered within the organisation and within the wider NHS. And then we expect you to be a team player with all of your colleagues at the university. Um, and with your fellow apprentices and a team player in that you will be asked to go on placement um, around Lincolnshire. Part of my job is to coordinate uh, all of the placements in Lincolnshire with my colleagues in other hospitals and other organisations. Um, and you might think, well, why are you sending me to wherever? I don't want to go there. But actually, we will look at what we think your learning needs are um, and we will try and match them with the best person who has the best skills um, so that you come out at the end of the programme as a really rounded practitioner with lots and lots of um, clinical skills, lots of academic skills um, and lots of um, ability to start to network with people. So you Please don't expect all of your placements, if you're successful, to be one within the organisation and two to be five minutes down the road from home. So you may be asked to go. We ask, we agree that as part, we make it clear that you may be asked to travel up to an hour to your placement um, as part of your learning. Um, so be aware of that. And that's a usual process which we ask of all of the students that come on placement. So we work with Lincoln University and we um, 
we don't just offer placements in Lincoln, we offer placements in Skegness, Boston, Stanford, Louth, Grantham, wherever. So you might be expected to travel as part of your placement experience. The other thing which I need to say is that uh, is about vaccination status. So if you were to be successful in going uh, and working on an, any apprenticeship program, then the university make it very, very clear in all of their online guides and all of their course contents that as we do as an organisation, that we would advise very, very strongly that you are vaccinated. Because if you were to go out on placement and not be vaccinated, it would uh, be severely limiting your opportunities to work in different clinical areas. And some organisations would not be um, accepting of you going out into practice. So we recognise it's an individual choice about um, um, whether you choose or not to have that, that vaccination. But equally, we're very open in saying that that would limit your, your options to progress your career development. And we're looking for people to come out from either the physio or the OT programme to have a variety of experience and be really rounded professionals. Uh, so let me explore to you with you the roots we have into learning and this is the case for both the physio and the OT programmes. So currently we work with both the University of Coventry and with Sheffield Hallam University. If we go down the Coventry route first, you'll see there are a few differences in how that they have developed their apprenticeship programme. So um, the Coventry route takes approximately four years to complete. It does have a September entry date and as part of the programme, you'd expect be expected to travel during term time down to Coventry at least one day a week. So regard, it depends where you live in uh, Lincolnshire as to how that will inf impact on your travel time. Um, you would need to be aware that you would need to be in Coventry by about 8.30 in the morning because lectures start about quarter to nine and they last until about five o'clock. So it will be potentially a long day for you. Um, so I'm just being open and upfront with you now, so there are no surprises. Um, in addition to that, we have an agreement within LCHS, which not every organisation follows, but we practice the, uh, the principle that for one day a week, which would be negotiated with your line manager, you would be entitled to um, a study day to do some self-directed study. You need to recognise that as part of the programme, you will be expected to do some study in your own time and there will be real pressure points during that time when assignments are due um, and you've got juggling, lots of juggling, at, juggling of family life assignments are still being present at work. So as I said earlier, it's not an easy option to think of doing the apprenticeship programme. And then throwing in the mix to that, there are what we call block placements. So across Lincolnshire, um, we try and offer a number of placements and dependent on where you are in the programme, these, pro these placements can last between anything between five and 12 weeks. So you'd really get to know a, a different working environment from the one that you're currently in. So you might be working in, um, in physical health um, as part of your programme, especially in relation to OT, because OTs are dual registered in uh, both OT, um, 
in physical health and mental health, you might find yourself working on, a, on an, a closed ward in an acute setting, or you might find yourself working um, on a dementia assessment unit, or you might find yourself working in a community with um, children uh, or young people with um, adolescent mental health needs. These are all placements that I've sourced within the last few months across Lincolnshire for, for some of our students. To be able to practice um, your uh, and become a state registered OT or a state registered physiotherapy therapist, you need to have completed as well as your academic content, um, at least a thousand hours clinical placement. So you can begin to see why you need to be out and about for these block placements. It's about, as I said earlier, experience in OT in lots of different areas. You will have only got one maybe snapshot of how OTs practice um, in their clinical areas at the moment. And the same with physio. So you might think that you might want to work in in um, you're currently working in older people's care as a physio, but you might need think about going and working in a hospice or with children or in respiratory services or um, um, or in our community therapy teams, all of which we're able to source in, in Lincolnshire or it might be something like rheumatology or orthopaedics. Lots of different opportunities which we source. What I would encourage you to do is, and I haven't put it up, but if you're really interested, depending on whether you want to follow the, the physio route or the occupational therapy route, is just use the link at the bottom, coventry.ac.uk. That will give you then um, the introductory page um, on, you can type in there, whatever apprenticeship programme, and it will give you an overview of the course content um, and what uh, it's working out at. Um, in terms of the entry criteria work Coventry, they are much more open recognising their vocational entry route. So if you've got level three qualifications of recent evidence on that support learning, so for instance, if you've done some anatomy and physiology um, and you're really interested in wanting to become a physio, then they will support you over that four, potentially over that four year period. So it's a lower entry point in many ways where you do the first year um, where you're doing a found, in effect a foundation level. So you're getting really to grips with study skills if you've not worked um, in an academic setting before, things that really will help you to consolidate your learning to later stage. So you might not, so you, so you don't actually go out on, on placement until your second year at Coventry on the um, occupational therapy programme and you go out for one placement in your first year on the physio placement. Moving across, um, you'll see there's a few differences with Sheffield Hallam. Uh, these, I should have said earlier, these are the only two um, organisations across the country that uh, at the moment uh, that have established these uh, both physio and occupational therapy routes to be in an apprenticeship, into an apprenticeship. So for both the physio and the, um, and the OT programmes, they are 30 months long, so they're a bit shorter um, and it's an uh, entry date is in January. In fact, our latest cohorts, three physios started with um, Sheffield Hallam um, about uh, three weeks ago now um, with the organisation. So we've got three people who have been employed, um, one working in a community hospital during, as their day job, one working in stroke services as, as their day job and one working in community therapy. Um, so they've come 
uh, some of them are our internal candidates and some of them are come from different parts of the country just because they want to take this opportunity up. The way that you're taught at Sheffield is different. So you don't go to the university one day a week. About once a month, you go to Sheffield for a whole week from Monday to Friday. And you will have that block learning for that um, for that period of time. So just be aware for things like family life that you might be expected to commute a lot for for a number of days or um, you might decide to stay there um, and have overnight as some students do um, to reduce the travel time. But does it would it work for you? In addition, for the weeks that you are not in in university on this block teaching, again, we offer one day uh, self directed study in and all of this takes place in term time. So you, we won't we don't offer you self directed study in not in term time because that's the time where you would need to be negotiating with your colleagues about little things like cover. Annual leave. Um, all of those practical things which you'll be entitled to as well. So again, um, throughout the training, you will be expected to do placements. Um, and again, it's somebody, it's my responsibility and another, other colleagues' responsibilities at the moment to try and source those placements for you, depending on what you're interested in, um, but also to, for us to try and give you that breadth of experience. And again, the same criteria, you're expected um, to complete a thousand hours practice. And if you look at the Sheffield Hallam website, same, same pro uh, process as I said with Coventry, they've got a very clear detailed plan of course content um, for both the physio and the occupational therapy route. So you're expected to do different uh, modules. They're usually broken down into about six modules uh, per term where you would have you need uh, and it's broken down into credits for, for the work that you do. So you might be asked to do an exam. You might be asked to do um, a presentation. You might be asked to do a case study. You might be asked to this morning I was um, discussing watching for the physio program there there as part of their blended learning approach where you do virtual stuff. They're producing a number of case studies where you're asked to watch somebody um, who has a particular condition and identify what it is as part of your assessment process you would identify and what might be happening there and what might be contributing factors to how that person mobilizes or um, how, how they how what their coordination's like what their balance is like what their pain levels might be like all of these things you'd be given tools and, and opportunities to to study so the universities are becoming very creative in how they will provide learning opportunities for you so um, that's a bit of the academic um, um, expectations. My next question is, well, my next part really is what can we offer you? So this is how it's worked to date. So um, I would anticipate in the near future, um, one of Katie's colleagues, a chap called Lee Gifford, will be will beginning to work out where what pot of money we have in terms of apprentices potentially for OTs and physios in the next academic year. Once we've worked out how many individuals we could potentially support, we will then start to think about where we need those people to be based in the future. So we're, what, we're doing what we call workforce planning. So we don't just plant you where you think it's where we need you uh, to develop and l learn those skills. So if you were successful, then you would be offered a post within the team. Um, and as I said earlier, 
for that to happen, you'd be allowed to and uh, given study time um, um, whilst that you're completing the apprenticeship. It is about giving you that varied career pathway. And on completion of the programme, you will become a registered professional. So um, we are monitored by the HCPC, the he Health Council's Professional and I can never remember what the last C stands for. I was going to look that up before and I haven't had time to do it. But that's our professional body who we are all accountable to. Um, and on successful completion of any course, you're given a, a PIN number to identify that you are competent um, in um, having completed an academic course. As it says on the slide, therapists are in great demand across Lincolnshire. So if you were successful, you would be highly valued. And it's our intention that you stay in Lincolnshire, that you don't disappear to South End on Sea or Penzance or to Aberdeen. We expect you to, as part of the learning and part of our commitment to uh, joining this programme that you will stay within our organisation and within the wider Lincolnshire system for as long as the equivalent length of time to whatever your programme was. So we'd expect you to stay for a minimum of 30 months in LCHS if you are successful in completing the programme. As an incentive for that, we work through what's called on a national um, programme which is called Annex 21 specifically for um, apprentices. Basically um, I'm not going to go into all the legal aspects of it because we I don't want to bore you anymore but but as you progress through um, all of the academic pathways that's required as part of your qualification you would get your salary would increase so from whatever your entry point is, you get various increments at key points so that on completion of the programme, you would be at 75% of a band five salary, which is the opening. Uh, that's the first, that's the opening level of any registered practitioner, nurse, OT, podiatrist, physio, or whatever. And you get the further 25% on, on completion um, of jo when joining the team. There is a flip side for this SO, and you should know that, that should you fail at any point, the trust would not be obliged to offer you a post. So your apprenticeship would end um, and the trust wouldn't be obliged to offer you a post, a rep, a, an alternative or replacement post. So it's about being open and transparent with you from the start. But it's people like me that help keep you hopefully on the straight and narrow to, to try and work out how to achieve the, the bigger goal of becoming um, a state registered professional. So I have talked an awful lot there. I'm going to I'm going to close the the slides down so I can see all your faces. And but just this is an invitation for you to ask me questions. So please, if you've got anything that's that um, you want clarification on, then I'm more than happy to to have those discussions with you. So let me just close that down. Any questions from anybody? And I'm happy for you to see have copies of the slides that I can put that I give them either to Katie or put them in the chat for you. Any questions? Hi, Graham. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> go on, you go, Grace. You go. It, it's just about the placement. So the thousand hours placement that just you have to do your placements within term times. Yeah, 
so it's so all it's planned it's all planned in so you have a so you have a course when if you were successful then you would have a, a it would all be mapped out for you of knowing when you were at university when you were in your day job and when you'd be at out on placement because your team would need to know that you were when you were out in practice because you're not going to be there and there that's obviously going to create a gap in the yeah. service provision. So the, the term time would be basically what school term time is. Not quite. Oh. <laughs> um, so it depends which way you start. So so as I said earlier, Coventry start in September, which is mm. the usual sort of um, academic entry point. Um, um, so but Sheffield start in January. So they all run slightly differently, but the term times are basically and um, this is a rough guesstimate, but usually you get I get about two weeks off at Easter, but it's not really off because you that's when the assignments are starting to to happen in in the sense so I'm, I'm talking about Sheffield at this point of the January mm. one um, and you would get usually about four a four week window over the summer to when you could have your holidays. So you would be expected to start be back. So in Sheffield, you'd be expected to start back in at the university by uh, the the end of August, beginning of September. Yeah. And then you get some time off over Christmas. Um, um, so you'll get, in effect, you'll the whatever le annual leave you get at the moment. Um, you will need to use that annual leave in these windows that have been set by the university. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you you'd so you'd have to use your annual leave in the time where you wouldn't be on placement or study time. Yeah. OK. So so the university will very clearly stipulate this is this is when you need to be here at university and the, and they are monitored. They monitor it very, very closely who and they they let me know if people haven't turned up, they want to know why. Mm. Um, you know, and and that's not it's not Big Brother, but it's actually we're trying to cram an awful lot in. In quite a short space of time, and if you're having to catch up, then that that in itself can put pressure on you but also on the team um, uh, and the university. And also, um, so the Coventry University, that's one day of uni a week and one study day. Yeah. So do you still get one study day with the Sheffield programme as well? So, 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 I'll, so with the Coventry programme, it's usually on a Monday that you go to university for if you're an OT and a Tuesday if you and sorry on a Wednesday if you're a physio um, and then they study the study that's in your first year it changes it, in the second year it goes to to Tuesday and Thursday um, and then it goes back to Monday Monday and Wednesday for the for the uh, Coventry route you will get one day study um, in that that period that has to be negotiated with your line manager yeah so you're i need to be open and honest with you it you might it there needs to be an element of flexibility within that mm. um it's not a god-given right that you have every tuesday off no no no, um, it's, it's required though, isn't it? 20 percent, I think. It's, is it 20 percent? Well, it is 20 percent. That's what we choose to uh, to. Uh, that's what we choose to do in LCHS, but you will go to other you'll go if you are successful, you'll go and meet with other. 
people from different parts of the county and our country and they don't always have that opportunity mm -hmm. so, but that's what we advise as the gold standard in in Lincolnshire um, because we recognise that you need to go and do some self-directed study um, and we all need that work-life balance mm. um, so it is um, it is a juggling act that's the only way you of family life study um, and people will be saying are we having pasta again for tea tonight and because it's quick and easy um, 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 but that's what you have to learn that's part of the cost of it but it's yeah. not ever no I've just experienced that the whole juggling yeah. everything and commuting to Lincoln and stuff but yeah I've come through the other side so it's not yeah. too bad good and thank Sean, you I think you had a I'm glad I was just going to ask a bit about the application process um sort of from apprenticeship and learning and development point of view um what comes after that expression of interest form that gets submitted that's a really good question um so so And there's no e easy way of answering this, so it's, so go with me, <laughs> and it's a bit complicated. So it's all with COVID, everything has changed, um, and I anticipate that we will do this year if once we know that we've given the been given the green light to go ahead with the programs, we'll do what we did last year where the expressions of interest will be um, be made that we went last year you had to apply formally even if you're employed by within the organization we went through the process of you making a, a formal application because we went to both internal candidates and external candidates so you would need to apply through um, through NHS jobs to do that However, we make it very clear that we're looking for people with the right values. We're not looking for you to be the, the polished physio now. We're not looking for you to be the completed OT now. We're looking for you to have the right values. We're looking for you to have the right um, levels of energy and the right levels of resilience um, and we're also looking for people who if you come to me now saying you already know what OT is and I'm talking as an OT and you've got it cracked and that you've that you're already working as an OT and you're just doing this course to get your registration and that has been said to me, um, those people um, find themselves often at the bottom of my pile because they're not showing me the values of I've been open, I've been, uh, I've been transparent and actually they may have an impression of what an OT does, but it's only in a very narrow window. So, and based on that experience. So OTs and physios, I'm speaking as an OT here, OTs work from the cradle to the grave. So they will, I have worked, I've done paediatric placements where I've worked many moons ago now, where I've worked in, in a special care baby unit. I have worked as an OT in a hospice for many years working with people who are approaching their last days of their or last weeks months of their lives so what I'm trying to say is be open to those ideas and, and OTs are continually working in lots of new areas and if you are successful on the programme 
we are constantly doing developing what's called role emerging placements where OT, so as part of your learning especially in ot you're expected to go and work in an area which is totally new to to ot and you're asked to do a business case as part of your learning and to show how an ot could help working in that environment so it might so i've supervised in the last year students from lincoln university who worked gone and worked in a day center for um people who have a learning disability who are um, working in that um, who are needing support with life skills to move into more independent living um, that's an ideal area for an ot to my brain as an ot but it's something that the organization hadn't considered and they went and did, went and did a bit. They went away and developed a plan and a business case for that uh, for the future. Um, equally, I've worked with um, Lincolnshire Fire and Rescue Service as part of their um, role emerging placement because it's about um, they're often people who go in and identify people who maybe got mental health needs. Um, maybe they're quite socially isolated. They're hoarders. Um, and from a fire and rescue perspective, they may be at risk in their own home. So an OT has been working with them to try and develop plans there. So there's lots and lots of different opportunities. It's not, yes, there is a significant amount of work in, in um, hospitals, but it really could be with many, many different client groups. Um, so be open to that rather than thinking have an understanding of what you th what you think an OT is or what you think an o phys the core skills of a physio are but actually think about how you would explain that to a member of the public or to a new service uh, manager who's interested in developing a role for, for an OT in a different area I've gone off track there a bit, but what I meant Sorry. to <laughs> Yeah, but what I so what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the people with right values, the right skills. People who this isn't very professional to know, is it? If you come in knowing it all, then that rings alarm bells in my head. So applications are sort of filtered through so the people filtered. with the right values and the right so approach. When, other so ones when, that are put forward. So I'm giving you guys a big clue now because in a few <laughs> weeks time I most probably sat at my computer looking at lots and lots of applications. So I want to know about you. So when you write your personal statement, I want you to go to the back of the job description. And at the back of the job description is a personal as, as a person specification. So those are all the essential and desirable elements of what I'm looking for. So when you write about you and your experience and why you want to be an OT, use that as a bit of a framework to go. I have me. I I have completed my my level for assistant practitioner course in therapy that shows me what your academic level your, your skills are it shows me what it is and it says experience so i have joined the urgent care treat team in the last in the last few months i have had experience of working with people with parkinson's disease with ms who are frail, um, who are, um, who have complex needs. All of those things will help me to see that you stand out. And actually it'll make my life easier because I'll go, oh, I want to know a bit more about that person. I actually want to meet them as an interview. Um, rather than somebody 
not really telling me what it is that if they just say I want to be an OT or I want to be a physio. Well, why? Why do you want to do it? So if you it, assuming that you get shortlisted and bearing in mind last year that for we were looking at nearly in the hundreds for each of the um, each of the programmes. Um, assuming that you get shortlisted and it, and it does, it is about points make prizes. I say this a lot. Think about um, think about on your application form. I'm going to use that person spec. So if you can show me that I've done this, this and this, then it will make it so much easier for and but you'll more likely get shortlisted. If you get shortlisted and you'll have an in-house interview with me and another clinical colleague. And then we fight over who we actually want. <laughs> and that's and we've our fisticuffs about oh I really like her. I want this person and they go no I want that person but that's um, um, if you get selected and then you have to then from there you have to go to we will recommend you to go to one or the other university we will look at your skills we'll look at where you live where we think you're the best fit and we will say we think Joe Bloggs should go to Coventry for interview and we think Mary Brown should go to um, to Sheffield. Um, and then we will give you some pointers as to what the universities are looking for, but it's but at that point it's your opportunity to really showcase yourself to to show that you've got the academic skills because that's what the university is looking for. I'm looking for, have you got, are you the right fit? Have you got the right values? Do you understand what OT is? Are you going to be resilient enough to complete the programme? Whereas the university is looking at, actually this person has told me that they've read this article and this is what they've taken from it and how they would apply it to being an OT or a physio. They've shown me that they can do, they've got the study skills to do this. They've shown me that they understand what equality and diversity in the workforce is. They've shown me because as an apprenticeship, there are national guidelines that we have to follow. They've shown me what an understanding of British values is, are. So all of those things would get you lots of ticks. So we can, we can direct you, but it's, it's down to you as to um, really performing. And then from that, from that, if you're successful, and the university come back to, to myself and to Lee and we'll say. We might have put four people forward and we've got three places available and we'll go. These are the three people that we want, but the fourth person we won't leave in limbo. We will go. This is what we will need to do to help you for next time. It's not a never, but it's it's we need you to do a bit more of this next time. Grace. Is it a two stage interview then as well? It's two interviews. It is, OK. Yeah, so okay. it's two interviews. Now it might seem that there's a bit of a gap between one and the other because we interview everybody working on the premise that you might all be going to a Coventry in September. So, but actually there might be a big a bit of a gap because some of you might be going to uh, start in September, in January. So we don't we don't know who's going where until we've done the interviews, the in-house interviews. So we will decide we're going to signpost those people to that way and answer those people to that way. When do the um, vacancies, is it vacancies or when does it when does all that go out then? 
Well, that's a $64 million question, really. Um, um, I can't give you specifics yet because I don't think we know how much, how, what the funding streams will be yet. But what I can say to you is that with um, apprentices aren't going away, apprenticeships aren't going away, um, and um, as an organisation, that both of those universities know that we're that we are that we put our money where our mouth is. So we are committed to both of those organisations to working with them. So I would imagine that the well the last last year when we last year we. I think expressions of interest went out about the end of April time um, and we interviewed sort of mid May. Um, and then the interviews with. The universities took place over the summer. Um, um, so it's it's as open as that, I'm afraid at the moment. But when 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 I know, people will know soon after. Um. So to go back, it's a two stage process, and you've got to you've got to you've got to satisfy the first stage before you get to the second stage. There is no guarantee at the second stage that you're going to get through. If you think I've already got it in the bag, then I can almost guarantee that you're going to come up a cropper. Um, you've got to be prepared, planned. And I will. Signpost you and ask you lots of curious questions beforehand because I've got a very. I don't take bribes, but I've got a very good idea of what the university will be asking you. Anything else? from anybody else. Um, I'm just interested on where um, you do actually find like the vacancies when they do come up. So what we do, that's a good question again. So what we do is we. So is we with my colleague um, Katie's um, Katie's boss, Lee, and myself, and um, and some of the clinical team leads will be looking as to where we where we have vacancies at the moment, and where we would need we're going to be planning for needing staff in the future. So, as I said earlier, the the um, last year the we recruited uh, uh, physios into two of our community hospitals um, and one uh, another another individual has gone to work in stroke services and another is working with community therapy teams um, and another is working was one more and I can't remember where it is uh, is working community therapy stroke. Um, I've lost where one of the candidates, but I can't remember where they where they are. But um, but we we plan um, really where the need is and where the and where in the county we need people to be. The other thing to say is if you. Um, if you haven't got a driving license, this is a, we work for a community trust. So if you haven't got a, a driving license, um, please start to think about that because you'll need to be able to commute to various parts of the county, either in your day job or on placement. Whilst we can't discriminate against that, what I can say to you, it'll be very difficult for you to do home visits if you haven't got that opportunity to be able to drive. 
um, readily for across the county. Um, so I'm not sure to answer your question, Megan, I'm not sure where the. The needs will be. This year, but the expectation is that those people will stay in that team all the way to their. To throughout their training and then when they've qualified, they will work in that team. So they'll work, they'll do their training in that team and then it's almost a bit like payback so that they're going to work in that team and become a member, a state registered member of that team. So that's that's how we work. Um, Lisa, I'm sorry, I I think you were trying to say something earlier. Yeah, I think, well, Megan's just sort of raised the question anyway, and uh, I was going to say you pretty much answered everything I'd got listed down. So it's obviously a very comprehensive um, cover that you know you know what you want to to let us know about, and everything I've got's here now. Okay. Yeah. So the sixty-four second time I said this, sixty-four dollar question is: Are you still interested? Absolutely. Great. That's good to know. I I hope I haven't put you off, but I've hope that I've been um realistic in that it's not it's not an easy um not an easy program. Um but the people that are going are through the program now um and who I support tell me that they're they have good days and bad days, but roughly they really enjoy it. And I and I need to say this um, as well. If you expect to be the same person that you were at the start of the programme and where you are at the end of the programme, I would be quite disappointed by that because we expect you to grow. You will grow in lots of different ways in confidence in skill, in being able to communicate, to get to to share the passion of why you want to be an OT, why you want to be a physio, to get alongside people, to deal with difficult situations. Um, so be prepared to to take to, to step out and out of that comfort zone um, and see where it takes you. Um, and that's part of the, another reason why you go on placement um, to work in different areas. Um, so for instance, Sean, Gina has quite often has OT students on placement from different universities. Um, don't tell her, but I'm going to be talking to her about another student soon. Um, I'm saying nothing to her. <laughs> um, um, Julie, Julie, on the on the your program, I taught. I used to teach on the a program as to be an OT. I taught Julie for many years. Um, um, so there's lots of different opportunities um, um, for you. And I always thought I was going to work in mental health. And then when I qualified, because I'd had the experience that I had, I thought, no, I want a bit of this. And I want to go and do a bit of that. And so I, where I thought I was going to be and where I am today is very different. So you've got to be open to the opportunity. Right. I've stunned everybody in sight, Katie. And and Lynn, from your perspective, is there anything I've missed or you want to qualify with me? No, Graham, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. I think I can echo from everyone's point of view. That was a really, really informative session. I know we've had lots of staff that weren't going to be able to join for your live session. And um, so I'm sure they're going to really look forward to catching up on the recording. And um, I think picking up on what you said, I think absolutely. Don't forget to show that passion, everyone. You know, we all know you're really passionate about 
wanting to go for it. So don't forget to show us that. I think sometimes you can you can see all the formalities and forget to add a little bit of a little bit of you into all these things. Um, and I have popped in. So um, Graham was talking about your supporting statements and the interview process. I have popped in the chat box and um, don't underestimate. As Graham said, there are lots and lots of applicants for all of these positions. Um, it's very competitive. Don't underestimate how important that supporting statement application is. Uh, we can support you that with that in the centre. We have got um, dedicated sessions around. We set you a fictitious job. Um, you go away, send any supporting statement and you will come and interview with us as if you're applying for that job. Um, it's a really good opportunity. We're all thrust into a very much a remote world um, and interviewing remotely can be quite it, very different than <laughs> you've noticed before. Um, so utilise us, use these opportunities to just come and practice, especially if it's been a little while since you've interviewed or done a supporting statement. We're more than happy to help you. But um, as you can see, um, there's fantastic amount of support here, as you've heard all the way through from Graham, and he really is an asset to link into if you've got any questions. So, and I'm sure, Graham, you wouldn't mind answering any from the chat as well if people have questions later. Not at all. Thank you. OK, at this point, I think I'll disappear, which means I can have a comfort break before my next <laughs> meeting. <laughs> I wish you all well and and each application is anonymized as you would expect but really go out there and tell me because it's it most probably will be me that will be reading all these many applications why you want to be an ot or a physio don't hide your light under a bushel okay go thank well you. everyone take care thank you thank so you. much Graham. thanks thanks a lot Cheers. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Um, so Graham has talked through the different degree opportunities that we have for you. Um, I am conscious we've had lots of queries come through um, about vocational ladders. So staff that are joining may be wanting to join the organisation and work through their level three, level twos and level threes. Um, so I will be covering those areas now. Um, so it's lovely if you if you are going to stay with us, but I do appreciate if you are just looking, you've got the qualifications, you wanted to go straight into the degree, um, please feel free to, to drop off now. But equally, you are more than welcome to stay if you've got any questions or you just wanted you were just interested and wanted to find out that's okay as well but have you got any any questions before i get started and i'll just run the presentation from this side so catherine are you you say you're going to talk about the level three stuff now is that are other people joining in um, so unfortunately, this, people can drop on and drop off at any yeah. point in these yeah. sessions um, and we do obviously work in clinically. Um, we all know it doesn't always fit. We can't always join these things when we need to. So that's why we're recording the session. Um, but I am going to have a little chat through um, start from the basis level. So have a little talk around um, care certificate your level two and your level three. So if someone's wanting to join the organisation or maybe they've come from a background that doesn't include healthcare, just provides the roots of how they can go um, forward to occupational therapy or physiotherapy. So yes, that's what I'm going to be running through. Does that answer your question, Lisa? I think I waffled. No, I think that's fine. I was just trying to work out um, what was going to come next. And because um, I have got a question about previous qualifications and stuff, and I just think whether that would be appropriate to ask about now or. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I've I've not come in from the organisation. I've not got a care certificate, but I did work with the ambulance service. So um, I have a level three in terms of the clinical experience there. And then the years that I've actually put in on the service. Um, and I've already worked, um, I've already got a PGCE. Uh, so I've already done a postgrad certificate. So I've kind of got qualifications, but they're not relevant, if you know what I mean. They're not exactly relevant. And I just wondered how well they would transfer over to, to what you were looking for, really. Yeah, absolutely. Lisa, are you working in the trust? You're working with us now, are you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Service. Uh, my first suggestion would be um, is if we pop you onto your care certificate, um, it is something that everyone looks for and it is a requirement for the university, so they will ask you to do it anyway. Yeah. Um, please bear with me one second. Grace, it was really lovely to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, sorry, Lisa. Um, no so it's one of those things we always suggest that you um, you do complete. Um, so if you're happy, I can get you enrolled onto that, Lisa. It's not a problem yeah, with your that'd be good qualifications we do accept recognised prior learning uh, which Lynn's going to go into in a moment when she talks about the care certificate and yeah. um, so that's um, definitely something uh, that we can support you with so it might just be that we just need to do the observation element with you 
to yeah. fill in the the gaps for the care certificate yeah cool. um with regards to the certificates and transferring them over what we do always suggest if you're happy to is you're happy to send us a copy of your certificates we can have a look at what credits are where what units have been been used um and then um it might be that we run those by graham as well just to get him a little to have a little look um because um universities requirements can change um every so often and if it's not uh, if it's not a qualification we're used to, we always like to double check that out. So if you're happy to, if you want to send them, send them over direct to me or yep. pop them over to the Apprentice Centre um, okay. and we can have a little look for you um, and yeah, just see if there's anything we can be doing to support you, if that's helpful. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. Thank you. Lovely. You're more than welcome. OK, Megan, do you have any questions before I get started on the presentation? Um, yeah, just with obviously I'm in my second year of college now, so I'll be finishing like in the next few months. I was just wondering, will I still be able to apply for them, obviously, with having no experience or, or will that like will it be affected? Um, obviously, if we can get you some experience, that'd be really beneficial, Megan. There's lots of different ways that you can do that. It's not necessarily a, a barrier um, to any of these choices because there's lots of people that go, um, might do their um, A levels and then go straight to university. So there's lots of different things that we can we can bear in mind to support you with. Um, have you looked at any volunteering or anything like that that you might be able to do to support you? Um, I have done some work experience. I've done online work experience. I did the Allied Health Mentor experience, and um, I've done the talent academy experience as well because obviously with COVID I can't go onto a ward to do actual work experience. I've um, been to my local GP surgery and watched some like physiotherapy but that's like all I've got at the moment with obviously the restrictions. No definitely it sounds like you've made a really good start because it's really tricky isn't it with COVID's made everything yeah. a lot a lot more difficult um so um so yeah that can can be a barrier um on there so there's lots of different things um that can be supported obviously um utilize things like the interview techniques that you know it's not just for internal staff that we do offer those for um yeah. so let us know if you're interested in anything like that we can also let you know if we've got any opportunities coming up it might be yeah. with shadowing or something along those lines obviously as i'm sure you can appreciate working in the nhs we need to make sure we're following all the correct risk assessments so i'm not sure what the opportunities are at the moment but do you want to um, pop me an email, Megan? Yes. If you're happy, I have your email address and I can have a little, little look into what we've got available yeah. um, and just see if any of them are of interest to you. I'm more than happy to do that if you want yeah, to. You. Frequently, if you just want to send an email to the Apprentice Centre Inquiries inbox, I'll pop it in the chat in a minute. Lynn might be doing that for me as I'm talking. Um, you're welcome to do that as well. They'll both come through to um, through to the team and we can support you with that. Um, what do you want? Are you wanting to go for OT or Physio, Megan? Um, I think I'd apply for both. I'd be quite happy doing either. Probably OT would be like my first choice, um, but I was quite interested in applying for both. Lovely. Um, so hopefully you've had lots of tips there from Graham, the different things you yeah. can be looking for to, to support you to, to move forwards. Um, but definitely pop us, um, pop us an email um, and I can let you know anything we've got coming up that might be able to support you. Right. Yeah, thank you. You're more than welcome. Lynn, you've got your hand up. I have, yeah. I was just in just in reference to Lisa. Um, your name rings a bell, Lisa. Are you, I think you've. Do you work at Skegness Hospital? No, I work at um, Bentham. Sorry. Sorry, I can't hear you. Are you I keep putting this out of the way because I've been coughing. I didn't mean to. Sorry. Um, I work with Julie, Julie O'Rourke. So she's based out of Beach House. I'm based out of um, Grantham, but still part of the urgent community response team. Um, I, I've not been to Skegness, um, but Sharon Pryor, I don't know if you know her, but she's part of our team. So maybe maybe that's the connection. She's that direction. Um, I deal with some of the care certificates um, and I'm your name. Uh, rings a bell. Are you, have you not completed it? Oh, I've got a work email thing coming through. I'm ever so sorry. Can I come back to you later, Lynn? I've just got my because I've got a work call now. Don't yeah. worry, Lisa. Please yeah. don't all worry. All right. It's not a problem Thanks. at all. Bye bye. So. Um, for those that are joining on the recording, we're just going to start working our way through now. I'm just going to cast the presentation to the screen. So I'm hoping that one of the lovely ladies I can see on the screen will let me know when you can see the presentation. Lovely. Thank you very much, Lynn. OK, so 
Um, I think formal introductions might be quite nice, Lynn, if you're if you're happy. So um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Katie Caston and I'm the clinical assessor for the Apprentice Centre here at LCHS. And Lynn, I'll pass over to you to introduce yourself as well. Sorry, Lynn, we can't hear you. Sorry, I'll do that again. <laughs> Um, my name is Lynn Otaviano and I'm a clinical assessor at the Apprentice Centre. I work part time. Lovely, thank you. I'm really sorry. Just bear with me one second. My computer's wanting to try and do an update. Let me just close the box. It's always one of these things with ro working with remote technology. Um, so just bear with me one second. I do apologise. Let's try again. And then if you could just let me know when you can see it, that would be great. Lovely, thank you so much. Um, so welcome to the second of our sessions around um, how we can support you um, towards an AHP career. Um, so I have a really lovely video here that we're going to share with you um, from Angela Shimada, who is our Deputy Director of AHPs. Just press play. Hi, my name is Angela Shimada and I'm the Deputy Director of Allied Health Professions and Operations here at Lincolnshire Community Health Services. I just wanted to take the opportunity to say a massive thank you to everybody who is involved with apprenticeships here at LCHS during National Apprenticeship Week. From an, from an Allied Health Professional perspective, um, we have a number of people who are currently involved with both the occupational therapy and the physiotherapy apprenticeships, and it is great to see how this is progressing as a speech and language therapist myself, um, it is really great to see that the speech and language therapy apprenticeship is now available as well to our staff. And I'm really excited to see how this develops. So um, I will just say once more, thank you to everybody who gives up their time and energy into completing their apprenticeships. It's great to see how our workforce is developing, not only in allied health professions, but across all professions um, in the organisation. And I suppose I would just encourage people that if you're ever interested in what an apprenticeship could look like for you, all you need to do is ask. Hi. Fabulous. Um, so you can see on the screen, uh, there's two vocational pathway ladders here. So these are just visual demonstrations on how we could support you um, if you're new into care or you're changing roles um, to support you towards occupational therapy or physiotherapy. Um, so as you can see, the basis of both pathways is the care certificate at your level one. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass over to my colleague Lynn, who's going to tell you a little bit about the care certificate and what it entails. Lynn, I'm really sorry, we can't hear you. Oh, I've done it again, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so the, the care certificate is a level one um, certificate. It's uh, everybody does it who comes into LCHS. It's really um, aimed at people who are new to care, but it can be for people who have already been working in care. And it's something that's mandatory for LCHS. So you do this at the start of your career. It uh, consists of 15 standards, which are listed there on the slide. Uh, and this involves workbooks, observation and reflection. So you complete workbooks on those 15 standards. You also have to have an uh, observation by your manager and also complete a short reflection at the end of the course just to so that, tell us what you've learned. Um, it takes, it's say, four to 12 weeks duration, dependent on the organisation, and it depends on whether you're new to care or if you've been in care before. And basically, the care certificate is the gateway to every other qualification that you might do with us. So it's a, it's a starting point and it gives you a broad knowledge and an awareness of what um, what we're looking for at LCHS. Lovely, thank you, Lynn. OK, so look a little bit at the level two healthcare support worker apprenticeship. So this runs over 12 to 18 months um, and it does have an endpoint assessment. It's very much suitable for learners who are new to the care, the um, healthcare environment um, and don't previously hold any qualifications in health and care sector. So there are a range of mandatory units and optional units that you can choose that relate to your job area of choice. Um, it's 
as it says on the screen as well, it's also based across a variety of different clinical locations um, and there's opportunities for get in and get on. So get in would be if you haven't worked in healthcare before and you join the organisation on an apprenticeship to support you to develop your career and get on maybe a staff member that's existing within the trust and you're wanting to progress your skills um, and increase that knowledge that you have moving forwards. So there are some requirements uh, for the level two healthcare support worker. Uh, that would be functional skills at level one and care certificate. So the care certificate Lynn touched on previously and uh, is a requirement and the functional skills requirement is level one, but you will need to meet level two before you go through to your endpoint assessment. So there is um, the main components are your level two BTEC diploma in care, your functional skills, English and maths if required and the endpoint assessment. So moving on to look at the level three senior healthcare support worker apprenticeship. So this runs 12 to 18 months and again includes an endpoint assessment. It's uh, again based over a variety of clinical locations um, and there are lots of different pathways that you choose. So if you are wanting to aim towards a physiotherapy, occupational therapy or speech and language degree in the future to progress your skills, you would follow an AHP pathway and through that your assessor would support you with the skills to enhance your knowledge in your chosen area and provide you with the skills working very, very closely with your clinical team, your mentors to really nurture that confidence in all of these areas and will be very much supporting you to feel ready and confident to move forward if a, a higher qualification is what you're after. So they're very, very great, brilliant courses to do, very, very supported and the requirements for the level three are functional skills level two and again your care certificate. So we have pulled together a few top tips uh, that we do suggest um, if you are looking to develop your career to any of the qualifications that we have. I think the first one that's worth touching on uh, is academic and reading academic reading and journals are a requirement from your level three upwards and they're a great idea to get started being confident to read all of these if you are wanting to progress to higher education it's really going to support you in those early stages of university and as graham touched on earlier it is something that the university might ask you at interview um, so it's really important that you keep up to date with reading anything that's current in your area of choice lynn did you want to jump in um, and have a little chat around the manager Yes, yeah, sure. So um, with any of the qualifications that you're going to undertake, um, would be a care, uh, care certificate or apprenticeship, you need to be heavily involved with your manager. So your manager will be there to support you. Also with the care certificate, they're there to um, write your observation about you, but also when you go on to further, uh, further levels, they will be there to support you with their experience and also in helping you get the time that you need to do any study work. Lovely, thank you, Lynn. Um, so the next and our top tips is qualification. So you need to make sure you're aware of what you have at the moment um, and what potentially skills gap we might need to meet um, to get you to your career destination. Um, make sure as um, a really important tip, we have lots of people come to us um, with the qualifications and they come to apply and they can't find these qualifications to um, provide them as evidence. So make sure you're finding these certificates really, really early um, and being able to get copies um, if you can't locate them just to support you with any applications that you might do. Lynn, did you want to pop in around interview techniques? OK, so moving on to interview techniques. So before you uh, are going to be going for your interview, uh, the Apprentice Centre can help you with interview techniques. So it might be that we can help you writing a personal statement before you get to the interview or putting on, we put on workshops to help you with interview techniques where we may be put on a mock interview for you so you can see the sorts of questions that you will be asked at your interview so that you're ready and prepared for when the real interview happens. Lovely, thank you, Lynn. Uh, so Resilience Graham touched on this really, really nicely earlier. Um, so as you said, these these courses are incredibly rewarding, uh, but it, they can be like a roller coaster. Um, so it's just going into them uh, with our eyes open, really, um, and recognising there are going to be times that are quite tricky, but that uh, that is, as you can tell from the recording so far, there is so much support out there for you to support you with all of these. 
So recognised prior learning, we do accept recognised prior learning um, towards the qualifications that I have and Lynn have been running through. Um, so it's really important to let us know any qualifications that you do have, as we may be able to cross reference these over to um, the different qualifications that you are completing. Um, so always let us know if you're doing something um, and we will see how we can assess that against the required criteria. So I'm just going to press stop on the record on the recording for the PowerPoint now, just so I can see you a little bit better and I can come back to you. Um, so let me press stop on the recording as we've had no one else join. Um, and then everyone can jump in as they require later. Um, so for those of you that are joining us for the recording, please feel free to utilise the chat box. It will be continually monitored um, and we will provide any support that you need um, through there. Um, and we can arrange meetings with you if you want to talk on more of a one to one basis. I'm just going to stop the recording now.